Hello and welcome to Gardening at 58 North. So in this video I'd like to talk to you about some unusual graphs that I've done recently. Two of them have been successful so far and the third graft I'll be trying is one that was successful for me last year but I haven't actually done yet this year and I'll probably show you the process of how I do that at the end of the video. So the first plant I'd like to show you is this one here. This is a pelagonium, it's also known as a zonal geranium and I basically got two different varieties and I grafted one on top of the other. But the varieties are very different, they're different species, it's not just different varieties and they grow very differently so I was a bit surprised that these actually grafted. The one on the top here is a trailing pelagonium and it tends to have quite thin woody stems and small waxy leaves. This one at the bottom is a zonal geranium and this one it has thick succulent stems, uh, large furry leaves and so it's very different, especially the stem type. I wouldn't have expected a small woody stem like this one here to graft onto a succulent stem, but it's done it absolutely fine. So to show you where it's grafted, it's just at this point here. Everything above that point is the uh, trading one. Everything below is the zona geranium. I was breaking off most of the shoots on the bottom one to give the top one a bit more growth, but then I wanted the, to be able to show you what the flowers look like on the bottom plant so I can show you that they are actually different uh, species. So that's why I've left the bottom half grow. After this video I'll probably trim off a lot of the lower sections. That way it should put in more energy to the top graft. So I'll zoom in now and show you a bit more of the graft union. It's not a perfect graft. Um, it is quite a precarious one. I reckon if I took this outside the wind would probably break it off. But it has worked. This plant was actually very small when I grafted it. It was probably only up to about this height here. So it's actually grown quite a lot. It's also got two flower spikes as well. And it seems to be growing quite healthily at the moment. So the graft, although it's quite a weak union, it's uh, definitely strong enough that it's got plenty of sap flow going through it. So this is one side of the graft union. As you can see from this side, there's not a lot to see. And this side is the side that hasn't really taken so well. But it gives a good demonstration of the thickness difference. So you can see on the lower stem, it's quite a thick succulent stem. And the top one is much thinner. And it's, this isn't thicker just because it's a more mature stem. The, the new stems appear on the on the zonal geranium quite thick and succulent to begin with and they don't really thicken up a huge amount and this top variety the stems tend to stay small and that that's part of the reason why they're useful as a, as a trailing geranium stems can't support themselves so they tend to trail down at the moment it's still growing upright but it should start that trailing habit later on as long as it, the graph union doesn't snap so i'll show you the other side now and show you what that looks like so this is the other side of the graph union this is where it's mostly taken you can actually see some thickening there at the graph union it's still quite a weak one though as i say if i was not careful this would easily snap off but it has grafted and it's growing quite nicely now so what i'll do now is i'll have a look at the uh, growth characteristics in a bit more detail and show you how different these two plants actually are. So first of all I'd like to show you the, the rootstock which is the zonal geranium. You can see here the leaves are quite furry. You can see the bit of a, a kind of a sheen to the surface. That's the small hairs on it. The new growth is also very thick as well as soon as it starts. It's thick. It's not woody. The stems are quite succulent. And this tends to be a little bit more drought tolerant than the, than the trailing variety because it has those succulent stems and it has the the uh, hairs on its leaves, it can tolerate drier conditions just a little bit better than the training variety. The leaf size of this as well is quite large, um, that's another differentiating aspect of this. And when it comes to flowers, flowers tend to be larger and they're quite full looking as well. So this is an example of what the flowers look like. It's not the best example because these are just going over. It's kind of hard to show you a perfect comparison because they have been flowering at slightly different times. But this one here, as you can see, is quite full with flowers. The petals are quite thick and you can't see in between them. The individual petals, they're touching each other and it's quite a thick clump of flowers. Whereas if I go to the trailing variety, the flowers on this trailing variety here, the pe petals are much more narrow. You can see there's actually gaps in, in between the individual individual petals and the bunches are much smaller as well there's only probably about five or ten flowers in each bunch whereas the the zonal variety has up to 10 or 20 flowers in each bunch so I look at the uh, the leaves as well on the on the trailing variety so you can see here the leaves are much smaller the stems are a lot smaller as, as it begins as well it's a very narrow thin stem the leaves are small and waxy as well any kind of sheen you see in that is mainly from the kind of glossy appearance of the leaves it's not from the small hairs and it's just a much more dainty plant and uh, as I say the stem's a lot woodier. So I'll keep this plant going for the summer, see how it does. I might possibly keep it for numerous years. What I'll probably do is I'll take off a lot of the lower stems and focus more energy onto the grafted section. And what I might get is a nice trailing habit. What, what I will also do is I will trim this top one soon because I'm worried that a graft union isn't strong enough and it might snap off. I'll take some of the excess weight off the top, allow it to branch a bit more and hopefully by then the graft union would have further strengthened and it then can support a larger plant. 
So the usage of this graft might be handy if you want to make a standard where you have a long clear stem and then trailing variety at the top. The zonal pelagonia at the bottom here tends to grow quite long straight stems that which are fairly sturdy. You could easily grow one up to one or two foot in height, then graft the trailing variety on the top and you get a nice kind of cascade habit, a bit like a, a weeping willow or something like that. It would just kind of trail down from the top with the top flowers. So there might be some um, potential possibilities for this in the future to make an interesting plant. Um, but this was just a quick experiment to see if it would work because I wanted to see if there, you could actually graft very different uh, stem varieties uh, even though one is a succulent stem, one's a woody stem they are related, they're in the same genus so that's probably why it's worked So another graft that I've tried recently which is one that I've not heard of before certainly and it should provide some interesting results is a graft here which is a dahlia, a normal flowering dahlia onto a species dahlia which is dahlia imperialis which is a, a type of tree dahlia so the top growth is just a normal kind of flowering um, dahlia that you would normally get in the garden. I've also done a very small graft here which is just starting to take as well. I've just tried a couple of different types of grafts. This one I did, uh, did first and that's why it's grown a lot bigger. Originally this was just very tiny. It was probably only about this height here. And it's grown quite a lot of growth recently and it's grown very well. So this is actually taken very nicely. I'll give you a close up now just so you can see how nice the graft is starting to take. Now this also isn't a perfect graft. Um, I'm just experimenting. I'm not a, an expert when it comes to grafting. But there's plenty of regrowth starting here. You can see this real thickening up there between the two. Uh, there seems to be two points which have grafted nicely. The top one being up here. There's a little bit at the bottom there. You can see the green stem of the daily imperialis and the, the darker stem of the of the garden dahlia. You can show, so you can see the difference there and the also the, the little section where they're kind of thickening up. That's where the graft is taken. That's really thickened up a lot in the last week or so and the, the graft has put on some really strong growth. It's interesting to see the growth is actually starting to appear slightly different to how it grows on its normal rootstock. So I'll now zoom out and give you a better look at the dahlia imperialis and show you why it's such an unusual dahlia and why this graft might have some interesting results. So this is the dahlia imperialis. As I said before, it's a species dahlia. It's not very commonly grown in gardens. If you live in the subtropics or kind of warm Mediterranean climate, you might get a few of these in your garden, but anywhere temperate, normally people don't grow these. These are the, probably the tallest dahlias in the world. They can grow five to eight meters in height, and they need a very long growing season. So here in Scotland, they're not likely to grow and flower. They'll probably just have lots of leaves. I'm just growing this for kind of a jungle appearance in my garden. It's been growing uh, for about two or three months now in my conservatory, and as you can see, it's already reached right up to the ceiling, and I've actually cut the top off just the other day to reduce its growth. I'm just waiting to plant it outside. Now these are really big plants. The stems can get much thicker than this. Uh, this stem is already much thicker than any other dahlia I've ever grown and it will continue to get much bigger. One of the common names is bamboo dahlia because it does look quite a bit like bamboo with the sections as it grows. So it grows absolutely huge. It doesn't flower until the very end of the year. November, December time when the frost normally kill it. When you compare that with a normal dahlia that you would grow in your garden, they only grow about one to two foot in height, maybe three foot for the taller varieties. They have really big flowers, but they tend to flower most of the summer, starting around June or July, depending on the variety, and right through to the first frosts. So the idea of this graft is the tree dahlia has a very strong, vigorous form of growth. It's going to have really strong, vigorous roots, big tubers, and a strong stem. So if I graft a a normal daily on top of it, it should get some of that extra vigour and strength from the strong root system and hopefully produce a larger plant and uh, possibly bigger leaves, possibly bigger flowers. We'll just have to wait and see. The only thing I don't know is what triggers the flowering. Generally with dahlias it tends to be the day length and with this one the day length is right at towards the end of the year when it's quite short days. That's when it decides to flower. Uh, but I don't know if that can be triggered on a stem-to-stem -stem basis or if it's on a whole plant basis. Uh, it depends how the hormones are transported throughout the plant. So it'll be interesting to see what happens having this shoot on here. What I'm hoping for is this one can still flower quite early in the year like it would naturally. And that will actually get some flowers on this kind of midsummer. And if I'm really lucky I might even get flowers from midsummer right through to frost. But I'll just have to wait and see what happens with that. What might happen is the uh, the root system, the hormones from that might inhibit this from flowering and I might just get leaves all summer. Or the other thing that could happen is this might produce um, hormones for flowering and that might induce the tree dahlia, the, the existing stem that I haven't grafted on, to flower earlier than it would normally. So we'll just have to see if that happens or not. I'm not sure what it will decide to do. So, so far when it comes to the growth, as I say, it's only just started to get, up, get strong growth now. 
One of the interesting things is the, the new growth is a much paler colour than the, the original leaf. So the original leaf was this one here, which was mostly grown, about half of it was grown on the original rootstock. And then all of these leaves since have grown on this new rootstock. The leaves are currently much paler in colour. Also, they seem to have these kind of dark veins, which the original plant didn't have. So that's something new that I've not seen on this dahlia before. You can see the original plant here, this leaf doesn't have dark veins, but some of the bits at the bottom, which were still developing, do have dark veins. So that seems to be a feature of this. The, the, uh, the growth so far is quite strong. I haven't got any particularly long uh, or thick stems on this, but it's only just starting to come into growth, so I'm not sure how it would do. But certainly the, the graph seems to have taken well. The, the growth is very strong, and it should only get stronger from now on. So we'll see how this does. This will have to be planted outside soon, so there is a risk that the wind could rate this graft. I'm moderately hopeful that it will be okay, because it does look like it's quite a strong graft. You can see it's grafted in a couple of places, and it's quite strong looking now. What I will do though is if this gets quite big and we've got a strong storm coming is I might just reduce some of the, the top growth, cut off the top so it is less li likely that the wind will break it and damage it and that will also encourage it to branch and um, normally with dailies you want a little bit of branching just to, to help out with the flowering so you get more flowers instead of just one giant flower. So that's about it for this tree dahlia, uh, grafted with a normal dahlia. I'll give you guys an update later in the summer, hopefully we'll get flowers in this, I'm not sure. I've looked online, I've not seen any evidence of this being grafted before, um, but this being a herbaceous plant that dies down to the ground every year, this graft will only last for one year, it's not going to be something that can last for several years. It's just a one-off thing, um, but I might try it again next summer if this works well. But it's interesting to see, and as I say, it's such a big plant, the, the, the potential is that you could actually encourage this to branch by cutting off a few more shoots, and then you could have maybe five or ten different varieties of dahlia growing on just the one plant, and you'd have a giant tree covered in giant dahlia flowers. So the final graft I'd like to talk about, and the one that's very well known, is the tomato potato graft. What you do basically in this graft is you graft a tomato plant on top of the rootstock of a potato plant. Then you get two, a double crop from the one plant, so the rootstock will produce potatoes, and the top half would produce tomatoes. Now it is really a novel crop, they don't normally do this commercially because you don't get the, you don't get the best of both worlds. Um, you're better if you're wanting high yield, growing just one plant of each. And also it's quite tricky to, to do the grafting, a lot of manual labour, so it increases the cost a lot. So and sometimes plant and seed companies do sell the plants just as a novelty, but it's certainly not something that's done commercially. So I did this last year, I had relatively good success. I didn't have a very good potato crop, I had only one or two tiny little potatoes. In fact they were so small, they were probably smaller than the original potato I planted. So when it came to potato crop, it was a, pretty much a failure. But when it came to the tomatoes, I grafted this onto a beefsteak variety and all the other beefsteak varieties in the polytunnel that year suffered and they didn't grow too many fruits whereas the one that I actually grafted on potato roots, they actually grew much better. Now I think the reason for this was potato it is naturally acclimatised to colder conditions. It doesn't mind growing in colder soil. It grows well in a cool temperate climate like the UK or Ireland. So the, the colder soil temperatures weren't a big issue for it because even though I had it growing in a polytunnel the soil was still getting quite cold at night time. With the temperatures dropping at night time, the soil was still a little bit cold for the tomatoes. So I think that just gave it an advantage. Whereas if it was growing in the soil with the tomato roots, because tomato plants are a tropical plant, they like warmer soil conditions. I think that's why the ones on their own roots actually didn't grow as well as the ones on the potato roots. You'll probably have different results if you live in a hotter, more tropical type climate. They'll probably grow better on its own root system. But for me personally, I found that they actually cropped much better tomatoes growing on a potato root system than it did on, a, uh, on its original tomato root system. So I'm going to be doing the same again this year. I'm going to be trying a couple of different things, trying to get more of a, of a crop. I think the problem is I had the potato in too small a pot to begin with. And so by the time I planted it out, it didn't really have the space to, to grow its roots for setting out the uh, potatoes. And also didn't earth it up. Generally what potatoes do is they don't grow the new potatoes from the roots, they actually grow the new potatoes from the shoots. So you, what you have to do is bury some of those stems. The one I had was in a shallow pot, there's almost no potato stem underground, so it couldn't send out those running uh, running stems under, under the soil level and produce those potatoes. I think that's part of the reason I had problems. 
For this year, I'm going to be doing it differently. I'm going to be planting one, which is just like a normal potato, one that I've allowed to um, grow some eyes in, in good light conditions. I'll be planting this in the bottom of a deep pot, so it'll grow up a nice, long, thin stem, and then there'll be lots of stem underground, and then I'll be grafting the tomato on top of that. I'm also going to try it with some uh, potatoes I had sprouting in low light conditions, so these have already got the long stem. I'll then bury all this, these stems, and all these little side shoots which are just starting to appear here should grow out and produce potatoes, and then I can just leave a tiny bit on the surface. Once this is fully rooted and started to grow, I can then graft the tomato plant onto those three stems there, and then I'll probably just reduce it down to one, whichever one is the, the best graft. I need to do several grafts because I'm not guaranteed that they'll all work. Last year when I did it, I did have a good success rate. I grafted a few ones just as a test and I had uh, most of them actually work and be successful. But I did find it's, it was most successful the younger the material was. If I tried it with older woodier stems, they're not really uh, actively growing or thickening up. So they don't seem to graft as well. So the younger the stem, the better it seemed to be. So what I'll be doing now is I'll come back to that at the end of this video a few weeks later. Once these have put some growth on and I'll start grafting the tomatoes and I'll show you the process that I've, I used last year to uh, to get a successful graft with a tomato growing on top of a potato root system. So it's now a few weeks later. This isn't the exact same potato as I said before, it's a slightly larger one but it had a similar habit as it had the long thin uh, elongated stems coming up. As you can see it's rooted quite well, there's plenty of roots starting to come out at the bottom and uh, it's put on a lot of leaf growth recently. These shoots were, had no leaves on them at all a few weeks ago and it's actively growing now so I know it's a good time to start grafting. So the difficulty with this will be it's quite a warm day, it is quite humid still but the cuttings will dry out quite fast. These are the cuttings I've taken from the, um, the tomato plant. Now these will be stuck onto the potato plant but I need to make sure I do this quickly enough that they don't dry out. Um, so I might rush some of this video just a little bit because I don't want it to dry out too quickly. So what I need to do is I need to get a very sharp knife and ideally sterilized as well. The sharper the better. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to remove most of the leaves on these cuttings because until these have fully joined into the stem of the potato there's a real chance that these are going to dry out. So I need to remove the leaves because this will reduce how much water is being lost. So I just want them to be around about like that. And this one also has some flower shoots starting to appear, so I'm just going to nip off any flower shoots that I see on these on these uh, tomato slips because I really don't want them to go to flower. All the energy needs to go into leaves and getting uh, the the graft union. So I made sure that the tomato shoots are healthy and there's no diseases on them. I also made sure they were actively growing. I say it does tend to work better when they're actively growing plants. Now when it comes to the potato, what I need to do is select some healthy stems that are actively thickening. Um, there's a lot of side shoots in these, as you can maybe see down here. These side shoots could be an issue, I'll need to cut them off as they start to grow. You can see the side shoots between the leaves. I'm going to keep some of these leaves though, but what I wanted to do is get this section here. This section here is where it's actively thickening up, and it's most likely for the graft to take. So I want to cut that there. That's where I'm going to be making, making the graft. I'm also going to remove a couple of the leaves so it's easier to get in and tie the stem, but removing other lower leaves isn't essential. So I'm just going to do this on all these shoots so that um, I can graft them all. Now, when it comes to these grafts, you're not going to get 100% success rate unless you're a professional grafter. I'm certainly not a professional when it comes to grafting of plants. So I'm going to take several attempts because I know they're not all going to be 100% successful. So there's going to be four attempts on this that I'm going to make. The good thing is if they don't take, I could let one of these side shoots grow and then use that to try and make a graft. It's a very big potato, there's lots of energy underneath the ground, so it's going to keep sending up new shoots if these grafts don't take. So I'm just going to take a very simple graft where you basically just split the, the root stock and then insert the scion. The scion is basically the cuttings of the tomato. So it's going to be a bit hard to sew, but I'll try and get a close up. So this is the top of the potato shoot. What I'm going to do is just make a slit in the middle of it like this and then that's where I'm going to push in the um, the tomato. Ideally I would have done a bit more in the middle, that's a bit to the side, but ideally a bit more in the middle. And then with the tomato shoot, it does work better if you can come, if you can match the size a bit better. This I'm going to match the size fairly well with this one by the looks of things. Um, I could always cut this tomato scion slightly higher up so that we don't have such a thick stem. I'm just going to shave it down so it's kind of like a, the opposite of this cleft. So we go in here and shave again on this side. 
and that exposes basically the cambium layer which is the actively growing section of cells and if I can make that a little bit more it, it, it is quite difficult when it's this young um, but I want to make it quite uh, a large cut area so there's and quite a shallow cut so there's plenty of that cambium layer exposed that can then seal together and then all I'm going to do is push it in like so and then quickly tie it up with some string just very loosely now if you're doing this more professionally you probably would have grafting tape to tie it up with and you'd also have wax to seal up the the graft to stop it from from drying out also it, um, it helps to seal it together stop it from wobbling about too much I don't have all those professional tools with me at the moment um, but I found in the past simply doing this and tying it with a bit of twine it does the trick what I need to do is make sure that these don't dry out too quickly though um, so what I do is I put this in a humid location without any wind and keep the the roots well watered and keep the actual uh, sign on the top I keep that well misted so that it doesn't dry out so I'm just going to go ahead and do this for the rest of them now I probably won't film it because I need to do this quickly before they dry out um, but I'll show, you the, I'll show you at the end of the video once they're all grafted so that's the plants now all grafted what I'll do is I put this in a nice warm humid location if I can't keep the humidity high enough what I'll do is I'll cover it in a plastic bag just to keep that humidity up what I'll find is these will probably wilt quite a lot during the day when it's warmer and the humidity drops you know, look like they're dying but they should perk up every evening and then after about a week or so we should be able to tell if it's taken or not generally if it hasn't taken after a week these will shrivel up and completely die if it has taken these should start putting on some strong growth there is a chance they can put on weak growth without the, the graft fully taking because they can kind of absorb the the sap through the the cut a bit like if you had flowers in a vase and the flowers can still grow if they don't have roots so a little bit of growth doesn't necessarily mean the graft has taken but if we get strong growth and there's definitely development in the leaves then the graft will have taken so I'll give you guys an update in a few weeks time hopefully and we'll see how these have done I'll also graft the other potato the other potato was, was planted without these long skinny shoots so it's still well underground putting up its shoots so I won't be able to graft that for a little while and what I've done with this one is as you can see I've grafted them quite a bit above the ground so hopefully I don't have the issues I had last year of the tomatoes putting in roots to the soil there's a good gap there I can keep them above the soil and so it'll be easy to keep the tomato from rooting itself into the soil so that's all for this video and I'll see you guys in a few weeks time hopefully these will be successful I don't know what the success rate will be I'm hoping to get maybe two or three of these to work um, but it, it, it's quite hit and miss I find in the past I, I normally get about a 50% success rate when I use this method